Welcome to OpenS TV. Today I'm in New York together with Eric Munson. Eric is the founder of Aided Ventures. Aided is a late stage venture capital company with a thematic and fundamentally driven approach. So Eric actually grew up in Silicon Valley. So let's start with Eric's story. What did you see and what did you become? So yes, I was uh, very fortunate. My father moved us from New York out to Silicon Valley. He went to go work as the treasurer for the very first venture-backed company, Fairchild Semiconductor, a very famous case study if you're a, a student of history. And Fairchild was backed by Sherman Fairchild, and they hired the Nobel Prize winner, invented the transistor, William Shockley. And under Shockley's tutelage, he had a team of scientists and engineers led by a guy named Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore, and who hired Andy Grove. They went on to form a company called Intel. The manufacturing side of Fairchild was headed by a guy named Charlie Spork, who went on to found National Semiconductor. And the marketing side of Fairchild was headed by a guy named Jerry Saunders, who went on to found Advanced Micro Devices. So I was exposed early on Silicon Valley's machine of, of, of scientists and engineers and literally grew up watching Silicon Valley go from agricultural fruit orchards to what it is today, one of the leading engines of economic growth in the world. So obviously I had an interest and, and learned a lot, met a lot of people early on and some of my fondest memories are early, early, the early times in California. The, uh, the evolution of Silicon Valley continues and the evolution of technology worldwide really continues. And that's the exciting part of what we do today at Adit is bringing our vision and our perspectives on the technology development and growth to investors' portfolios today. But back to the history of Silicon Valley and growing up, I, I went to school at Berkeley, worked for Hambrecht and Quist early on in my career and had the privilege of working with George Quist and Bill Hambrecht while they were taking Genentech public and Apple computer public and ultimately came on to be a full-time employee, one of the first 25 employees hired with them. I worked in corporate finance and venture. I worked in syndicate and over-the-counter trading. I moved out to New York for them at a very early age and helped them reopen their New York office uh, where I lived for a number of years and commuted back and forth from New York and San Francisco. I worked in the, the new issues business so for them with the corporate finance team and really had an amazing education about venture capital and about uh, doing deals. So I've had a very long career, done a lot of different things for a lot of different companies. Uh, after four years at h and I, I was recruited to, and joined the Morgan Stanley training program and got my Series 7 and went through the training program both in New York and San Francisco. And I used the H&Q relationships at Morgan Stanley by providing asset management services, 144 transactions for corporate executives as well as venture capital investors. We had early relationships with uh, Don Valentine of Sequoia and Dick Kramlick of New Enterprise Associates and many of the early venture investors in the Valley. We managed cash for some of the corporations I helped take public while at h &Q. But ultimately, I went back to H&Q and helped them launch and relaunch, essentially, an asset management division in the technology sector. So I was investing in publicly traded growth equities after doing the venture capital work with them initially. And I ran a business with Michael Jackson and Al Tony there, which was very successful in finding investors looking at sector investing in emerging growth technologies. And we built out both a long-only business as well as a long-short equity hedge fund in 86, and we had a great success in 86 and early 87. And we were levered long in technology stocks in the fall of 87. So at an early age, I learned the benefits and the, the risks associated with leverage. And so in our business today, we use no leverage whatsoever, no borrowed money. What's important for us to focus on the fundamentals and to de-risk our investments in the venture space, in our opinion. And by doing the late stage and fundamentally sound companies, we think we take some of the, some of the risk away from that. After, after seven years at h and I, I chose to, to work at Franklin Templeton and was recruited to join the Johnson family. 
great respect for the, the Johnsons at, at Franklin Templeton. I learned a tremendous amount. And they, they allowed me the, the privilege of building out their private client division, which started with two investment professionals, myself, and uh, two assistants. And ultimately, we built out a $8 billion business with 20 people and hundreds of clients all over the world. And it was a tremendous learning experience for me, again, both in the alternative space as well as in the long-only space. And we integrated some of the people from the Templeton organization, which was a tremendously talented organization with uh, great global vision and, and international experience with boots on the ground in, in emerging countries all over Asia and Europe. It was a tremendous experience for me. I've built actually five different asset management businesses over the last 35 years in excess of $5 billion. So it's a, it's a wonderful business and, and it's a wonderful experience. My focus now is on helping entrepreneurs grow their business and uh, as a growth equity investor. And we're really excited about having a chance to work with some of the finest world-class companies in the world today. Companies like Spotify and, and, and Lyft and Airbnb and Palantir and SpaceX. These companies are changing the world as we know it. And Really exciting working with some of these entrepreneurs and, and some of the smaller companies that are not maybe as well known. And these companies now are springing up all over the world because the, the growth of technology means it's not just in Silicon Valley. The New York venture capital community is also very large today where it was a very nascent community only 10, 20 years ago. Venture capital is springing up in Asia and in parts of Europe. Uh, amazing entrepreneurial experiences. I was in recently in uh, Stockholm, Sweden and seeing incubators there. We've had a, a great relationship with uh, some of our Swedish investors after our Spotify experience and it's a nice community there. There's a lot of information being exchanged from other family offices who are sharing ideas with us and, and we have an ability we think to get really good information and provide investors great access to companies that are just becoming into their prime and hitting that growth area. So it's really an exciting time for us to be venture investors. We really are very, feel very privileged and, and are honored to be working with clients and companies like this. And we take the responsibility of managing people's capital very seriously. We also invest our own capital alongside our investors in every single deal we do. It's one of the things that we think makes us a bit different than many of our competitors because we have the majority of our net worth in the business today. We eat our own cooking, as they say, because that way we're all aligned. Uh, the entrepreneurs are aligned because they want the business to be successful. We're aligned that we want the business to be successful, and our investors are alongside us on the same terms and conditions going forward. And so as we succeed and the businesses succeed, our investors succeed. Eric, you have an incredibly long and broad history in investing. When you formed your company, Edit, right? What philosophy and what approach are you now focusing on? So the approach that we focus on at Addit is really to look at the broad, secular, long-term trends in the world today. Things like the internet and the cloud and fundamental things that are now everyday parts of publicly traded companies. The cloud 10 years ago was a big bet for Jeff Bezos and Amazon to make. And Microsoft had no, ex no exposure whatsoever. Now the cloud is driving profits at both Microsoft and, and Amazon, two of the largest cap publicly traded companies. And our vision is to look for the next long-term trends, so the internet of things, the shared economy, what's the effect of artificial intelligence on, on the economy and fintech, on marketing, on service economy. These kinds of questions, what's, what's the digital healthcare revolution gonna look like, immunomedics and, and genomics, fundamental changes that are occurring in our society that have profound implications for public and private companies. We're trying to express those themes in a private portfolio of late stage venture capital companies that we think provide us a how much and when equation, not an if equation. Now, our approach here at Addit is really to focus on companies where the question is, when and how much, not if. We've all invested in companies hoping that if they get the FDA approval or if they get this new contract, the stock price will improve. We don't want to be stuck having to wait about an if. 
situation. We want to focus on companies that have strong fundamentals, revenues, positive cash flow, earnings, and growth, real secular long-term growth, whereby it's a question of how much the company will be worth and when it gets monetized. We focus really on companies that are backed by top decile venture managers because in the, my experience of multiple decades in investing, there's very little persistence. But when I was attending Oxford's business, Said Business School, Professor Jim, Tim Jenkins over there works in corporate finance, and in the course we took, highlighted something called persistence. The only place persistence exists, that is to say, the same group of managers outperform decade after decade, quartile after quartile, year after year, consistently, is in venture capital. And we focus on those managers. We do not provide the list of those managers, and that list evolves over time. But we take the data from those managers and focus on those companies that are backed by that top quartile of venture managers because they have tremendous research information, they have a lot of capital, and they have the ability, we think, to help us identify the future blue chip companies of the economy going forward. So we use a fundamental, fundamental basis of stock selection within various sectors, long-term, secular trends and themes identify for us those long-term sectors of the economy that will provide us robust growth going forward. And we do a fundamental bottoms-up analysis on individual companies within those sectors. Cybersecurity, for example. FinTech, financial technology, is evolving tremendously. Artificial intelligence, for example. Digital healthcare. We think the logistics and the data. Uh, big data is another massive theme for us. We think the, the use of data tools uh, are tremendous. And we think that there's a tremendous amount of change ahead for the economy as well. We've seen uh, the, the digital economy begin to become a significant player. We think ultimately the digital economy may become the predominant source of revenues in retail and other parts of the economy. We also think we've been at a platform here where we've had the, the, the mobile phone be essentially the, the digital platform for a while. We think we're preparing for the next quantum leap. I don't know what that leap looks like yet. I don't know if it's going to be visual recognition, facial recognition, if it will be related to voice technology as we have seen the beginnings of voice actuated computers and things of that nature. I think artificial intelligence will be a massive trend, and it's very hard to find a pure play AI company that has profitability, much less, much less positive cash flow at this point. But we think there's going to be those opportunities for us to invest in select companies over time. And we are very selective. In our five years of history, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary this October, and we've made roughly 12 investments in our five years. And we're going to expand that as we go forward, as we have more research and more, more capabilities. Uh, I'm also backed by a tremendous team. Team at it is the best. We have, first of all, my partners, the McCooey family. Dan McCooey is a tremendous resource and a tremendous an individual with great character and integrity and great common sense. He's a, is a great golfer and loves to enjoy life, and, and uh, both he and his brother Sean and I started the business again five years ago based upon an experience that I had personally buying some shares of a privately held company. I thought I was doing that guy a favor by giving him some liquidity. Turns out he did me a favor. I bought shares of GoPro at about $6 a share. The stock went public within a year at $29 and change, and it traded all the way up to $96. I didn't sell it at 96. We sold it the ship. We hedged the shares on the way up. But Sean and Dan and I bought, looked at the transaction of buying it in the single digits and selling it in the mid 60s and said, this is a good transaction. We want to do this trade more often. And so we sat down and began trying to identify our investment. Our, 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 we sat down and started to try to identify the kinds of companies we wanted to buy, and that led us to creating these investment themes, which is what uh, we felt the venture community was expressing in their portfolios. And then we began sort of figuring out what some of those companies were. We started off with Spotify in 2014, shortly followed by Palantir, which is our biggest position today. 
Palantir is a tremendous enterprise software company, which is very much misunderstood by both the street and most of the investment community. We think Palantir is going to be a $100 billion company within the next three to five years. They're taking disparate data sets and putting things together for organizations like city and county governments and the FBI and the CIA and other organizations to use. They're helping uh, energy companies take all of their disparate data and drill, drill much more efficiently. British Petroleum is a big client. They're helping drug companies, uh, Merck AG, the big German company, take all of the interactions of drugs and figure out how to most efficiently develop new drugs and treatments to cure cancer. They do tremendous work in immigration on a pro bono basis. They're doing amazing work on logistics and traffic and weather forecasting, anything with a lot of data points. Palantir is exceptionally good at helping companies analyze that. They took Airbus's entire fleet of airplanes worldwide, every plane, every part, every procedure, and put it into a giant schematic, allowing Airbus to understand their entire ecosystem. And Airbus then opened it up as an open source to all of their customers to help them improve best practices, making their clients much more efficient. In the process, Palantir picked up several new clients, both United Airlines and ANA Airlines in Japan. So it's a tremendous company that people, I think, is very much misunderstood. It's got a billion and a half dollars in cash, growing at 30 plus percent, 40 percent now. And we think will be a public entity within the next 12 to 24 months. Airbnb is another prime example of an amazing company playing the shared economy trend. This is a real estate lodging company that doesn't own any real estate or lodging and is growing again at 30 to 40 percent, generating a ton of free cash flow, uh, providing uh, people of all economic levels from the smallest one bedroom uh, studio apartment to rent it out and generate income. And, and let people of, of uh, modest means come on and travel. They did over a million hotel rooms in the Olympics down in uh, southern, south in South America several years ago. So we think Airbnb is a company that's very democratic from the low-end apartments to the high-end luxury, everything in between. It's a tremendous way for people to utilize resources that they may have and generate cash flow. It's a great way for families to travel together in larger groups. Again, sort of the shared economy is much more of what today's world's about. The same is true with Lyft. So let's get back to the process of how the added portfolio is built. I talked about the venture sponsors of these companies. We're not a, we're not a fund of funds. Rather, we try to buy these shares of companies from the early investors or early employees of the companies. These folks, in case of early employees, may have the stocks at very low valuations. We try to buy the shares from them in the secondary market or other ways that we get to get the shares at very attractive valuations. Typically, we're buying shares at a discount to the last venture capital round because the, the, the seller, sellers we're buying from are fairly highly motivated sellers. And companies now, much of the valuation improvement in companies is happening while they're still private rather than the public markets. And so they're going longer and longer to go public. So the average company now is taking eight or 10 years to go public. Whereas when I was first in corporate finance and in venture capital back at H and Q, you're having companies that are two or three years old and it's just beginning to emerge, go public with a three or $400 million valuation. Now most of the companies going public like Alibaba and these larger cap companies are going public at valuations of 10, 20, 50 billion dollars. And so we try to buy them before they go public and yet at that inflection point before the valuations really get quite steep. We do it from by buying shares from early, early employees, early investors. In some cases, you know, the maximum length of stock options in this country is 10 years. So if the company's taking 15 years to go public and you're an early employee, you've got stock options that could expire, but they're still in the money. So we help them ex exercise their options. They get their equity. We buy some shares at a reasonable price. It's a win-win for the company, for the employee, and for our, us, our portfolios and our investors. So it's a very important process for us. We think that our entry point the value we buy the shares at is perhaps the most important decision we make. It's the one thing we can control is the price we have going in. We think we, we do our analysis and we do a lot of hard work based upon what the valuation should be uh, based on the curve uh, 
of the growth curve and the revenues that are being generated. But we don't control that process, obviously. We don't control if and when and how the company will, will be monetized. Will it be a direct listing? Will it be a public offering? Will it be bought by another larger company? Those are all good outcomes for us over time. And we've experienced both an IPO in the case of Lyft and direct listing in the case of Spotify. We think the direct listing model works really well for certain companies that don't need the cash and may have a already have a real presence in, the, in the awareness in terms of the marketplace. So a company like Airbnb, direct listing makes a lot of sense. We'll see what happens with them down the road. So those are all kind of ways in which we're able to buy stocks and buy good assets. We think future leaders in the economy at reasonable prices and, and we'll wait for those valuations to get realized. Our goal over the three to five year time frame is to return three times invested capital. That's the objective. Again, we've had good success with that over time and, and we're happy to talk with people further about our philosophy and our approach. We do it with fundamentals and we do it with an approach that we think is 10 basic steps and the fundamentals are the first part of that process. The next is a very qualitative analysis. Is it a good management team? Is the business scalable? Is the business well governed? We think that governance, good governance, is good business. We think sustainability is good business. I think the world is coming to the conclusion that you can't be an irresponsible executive, you can't be an irresponsible corporate citizen, you have to do the right things for your employees, for your customers, for your community, and for the world at large. Those are very important principles to us as, in terms of the long-term success of the business. So those are very fundamental things for us, very basic things for us. Sort of the final part of the equation is for us to look and see what the real, uh, we think, the, the, the scalability of the business looks like. Despite our, our investment in GoPro, which was a terrific investment, um, it was really a fairly narrow uh, business model, and they did scale the business successfully, and they've had challenges. We have great respect for the Woodman family who was involved early and founded the business. And we've known for a long, long time, uh, 40 plus years. But most of the businesses we're investing in now have a much broader approach and a much bigger vision in terms of what they're servicing and what they're providing for the community, a market, and then for the world overall. And those fundamental, fundamental quantitative and qualitative measures are really one of the things that differentiates us from our competitors. We've been doing it for a long time, and we also think that uh, most of our experience has been as principal investors rather than investing on behalf of other people. And we want to run our business in alignment with our investors and with the companies we're involved in and with our values as people. And that's a very important piece of the equation. And it's never, it's never, we, for example, we turned down Juul. The, the vaping company. My mother passed from lung cancer and I just didn't, was not comfortable. Um, even though the Juul people uh, believe they're helpful, I just don't believe that putting chemicals into one's body is a, is, a, is a good thing. And so we lost out on making millions of dollars because we passed on investing in Juul. But that's part of our value system. And we're going to say no a lot. We said no to DraftKings and to a lot of the gambling companies. We've said no to other companies that we felt that were not technologically sound or didn't align with our values. And so while it's a very difficult choice sometimes to make, we think it's the right choice for us. And we have a, a great portfolio of a dozen or more companies, and we're looking at more companies every day. We see, we see thousands of opportunities a year and I sometimes feel like I'm drinking out of a fire hose. So much information, so much change. The only constant is change in our, in, our, in our perspective. And I think it's really important to try to manage the changes that occur, to try to understand what's happening in terms of change, and be able to figure out a way to position a portfolio to take advantage of some of the changes that are occurring in the economy in the political spectrum, in the society as a whole. I had the luxury of studying uh, the political economy of industrial societies uh, while at UC Berkeley and with a minor in psychology. And while at the time it didn't seem very applicable to any career, today the stock market is dictated by politics, 
sociology, demographics, economics, with a huge dose of psychology every day with the fear and greed factor swinging stock prices and valuations. So we're very cognizant of what's happening on a real-time basis in the public markets as well as what's happening in the private markets. And we're trying to play uh, the, the opportunity set of real growth in growth equities while they're still private until such time as they become monetized, either in a, an acquisition, which we're seeing a lot of these days, we'll see a lot more of going forward, as well as the direct listings or a public offering. And that's really the niche we're playing in right now. We've done some work in the earlier stage companies as well, and that work is, is continuing and we're learning a lot more about that process as well. I'm curious, tell us more about the sourcing. So if you have identified a trend, a theme, or a company, how do you know you will get actually shares in that field? And then secondly, what is the overall capacity that you're trying to build or to cover with your investments? So the sourcing of the shares is really one of the things we do best. We, again, we've been in the business a long period of time. We have a tremendous network of people. Both my partner and myself have a, a long history in the business. He worked at Nash Weiss and Citigroup and Smith Barney before Whedon and Company. And one of the virtues of being a, a senior member of the investment community is having a lot of, 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 lot of friends and a lot of relationships. So we've been sourcing deals and sourcing shares from a variety of companies over the past five years. And they're all different sources. Uh, originally, we talked to early stage investors, early employees of these companies. We've had, because we're providing liquidity to people, people now come to seek us out. So we have had great success in identifying shares and working with a number of uh, companies, investors, corporations, as well as individuals in getting the shares. And the, we're very privileged. And in fact, we've had employees come back to us and say, look, I, I want to sell some more shares. I, I've worked with you in the past. Other people have bid me for the shares, but I'd rather work with you. And now people are coming to us. We had a, you know, a number of employees from some of the companies were involved in like Airbnb and SpaceX and whatnot that come back to us and want to work with us again and again. And it was, it's a great honor for us to work with people like that. It's a great compliment to have them uh, validate our ethics, our integrity, and the quality of our service, both to people who are selling the shares to us as well as on the client side as we provide them access. And we think there's a significant amount of capacity in our business. We think there's probably $600, $800 million of capacity in our business as it exists today. So we have the ability to double or triple our business without too much trouble. We don't want to ever become a, a huge index fund. We think that stock selection is of paramount importance and the disciplined approach that we bring has avoided a lot of the issues. One of the advantages of buying late stage companies is you shorten the J curve. The idea is you buy a company that goes up like a J as the growth ramps up. If you have a long period of time until the growth goes up, it makes it more like a, more like a backwards L. We want to make sure we get the J curve right as the company is hitting that really maximum growth inflection point. And typically that takes us a three to five year time horizon. But we've got companies like Decision Sciences, we own, which is a terrific uh, technology platform using scan, using naturally occurring atomic particles to scan containers, solving a huge issue at the borders of the United States and ports and the border crossings. Uh, this company has been around for 15 years and no one's ever heard of it, but they will very soon because they're going to replace X-ray with, uh, with the Decision Sciences technology. It's happening at the borders now. Really exciting, life-changing improvements in terms of quality of life, in terms of improving our society. These are the kinds of companies we want to be involved in. And so we've sourced this particular transaction from, a, from an existing client who was a former CEO of a Fortune 100 company who said, Eric, I've been an early stage investor here for a while. You really need to meet the, the management team and see the technology. So I flew out to California, met the management team, saw the technology work, and immediately knew that we had to get involved in this company. And we've been involved now for two or three years. They're now at positive cash flow and generating real revenues. Really exciting to see their vision become a reality and watch this improve the safety of our country the integrity of our process, and more importantly, uh, benefit society as a whole, as well as our shareholders and our investors. 
So these are the kinds of things that, is, that are win-win-win transactions. Doesn't happen very often on Wall Street, but it's certainly happening in our portfolios. And again, we feel very blessed to be able to, to work in this world and in this capacity with investors and, and, and with uh, companies and with the early, early employees and early investors in the company. So it's a very interesting opportunity niche for us right now. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great five years and we look forward to the next five years. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it looks like, but there's gonna be a tremendous amount of change, both in the financial services industry, in the transportation industry, in the healthcare industry. All of these industries are gonna be very, very different five to 10 years from today than they are. Drone deliveries and robotics and artificial intelligence, all of these things which are, you know, were space age concepts when I was growing up are now reality. You know, BHP Billiton is, is operating mines using robotically robotic machines crushing the rocks and using autonomous vehicles to move the, the raw materials into the mine, from the mines into the crushers, and, and it's amazing. The people who were driving the trucks are now operating the, 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 the vehicles autonomously and servicing the vehicles. So there's a way to retrain the uh, employees and keep them as good. they have a good experience and good values and, and make the, the economy a better place. I think the same thing will occur in, in the autonomous vehicles of evolution, revolution, as companies like Lyft offer retraining credits and educational processes for their employees, their employees will become, will, will be retained, the good ones will be retained and become helpful to riders providing safety or other reassurances issues. But these are the kinds of revolutions that we don't see very often, but they're gonna happen in our lifetime. And it's really powerful to be a part of. And so we think these, th these trends are here to stay. They're not gonna change. They're gonna change. They're, they're here to stay. The trends are here to stay and things will change, but we think that there's a clear path towards a, a tremendous opportunity ahead in, in many, many industries. And we feel very lucky to be on the edge of that. We also make personal investments in some of the early stage companies and some early stage managers. We do that really as a way for us to go to school on some people who have great expertise in the early stage. We work with a company uh, here in New York uh, called Compound. And Compound's headed by David Hirsch, who was the very first Google employee in New York City way back when. It seems now they own a huge, a huge building down in the meatpacking, but you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was he was the lone employee here in New York and helped them establish a beachhead here in New York and he's got tremendous partners and tremendous technologists who work with him and we go to school and learning about things like AI and quantum computing and uh, nanotechnology and things like that which will profoundly affect the later stage companies that we're invested in and so we have a, a tremendous amount of, of of inputs from both our team as well as our advisory board which is 12 members worldwide as well as other investors that we work with and share ideas with. Some of our best ideas come from other investors and from our clients who have tremendous experience and knowledge having worked in uh, private equity or venture capital or the capital markets. They get exposed to a lot of ideas and information. That comes back and helps us. So we really look at ourselves as a, as a source to, to uh, provide people information and share information with. We've had a great record of, of identifying companies and sharing those companies with people and people have reciprocated by sharing things that are in their areas of expertise to us. So it's been a very holistic, mutually rewarding ecosystem to work with our clients, our partners, our friends, our family, uh, our companies. And we look forward to continuing that as we go forward with more and more investors, more and more companies, more and more groups. Recently got back from trips to the Middle East and Asia and Europe where we have a tremendous opportunity, I think. Valuations are much cheaper, the growth rates are fairly high, and a lot of the dislocations that we're seeing given certain political issues are, are not as present as they are perhaps in more established markets. And so we think there's real opportunities in, in other areas. So we're looking more globally now and we're expanding. Uh, we have offices today in New York and California, and we perhaps will expand overseas as well as the opportunities present themselves. So we're really excited about the next five years ahead. I'm going to invite you, Matthias, to come visit us in October for our five-year anniversary. One of the things we do as a firm is we give back. And uh, we made a pledge on our funds that 
10% of the general partner's profits get contributed to charities. We let our clients choose the charities for us, and the clients this year have chosen a veterans charity that provides service animals to veterans. And we'll have that ceremony on the Intrepid Museum here in New York in October to present the uh, service animal charity with a nice check. And we think that that's a very important part of, of what we do is to honor people who have provided for our country and for our society. And um, we'll do the same thing with an offshore, with our offshore vehicle as well. Different charity, we'll find an offshore charity. And again, our clients help us identify those charities and they vote for us and make sure that the, mon the monies we donate go to good, good causes and make the world a better place, which is what we want to do ultimately, be it our investing or our philanthropic efforts going forward. Because it's one planet we live on, we want to make sure it's a, a good experience for everybody. Eric, what other trends are you seeing within venture capital that affect your business and that affect investors in the end? That's a great question, Matthias. I think one of the big trends we've seen in the last five to ten years is the rise of corporate venture capital. Companies like Google Ventures, Intel Ventures, a whole variety. And now you've got thousands and thousands of corporate venture capital investors, and they're very significant investors, strategic and otherwise. They typically are, are larger investors, and they're these days about 30 to 40 percent of many rounds of financing. So that trend is here to stay. We have great relationships with many of those investors, great respect for what they're doing, and they're good people to be invested alongside, and a source of potentially shares for us to purchase in the secondary market as we see opportunities. About a third of the shares we buy are primary shares, and about two-thirds of the shares we're transacting in are in the secondary markets, which are really quite liquid these days. That, that whole area has increased tremendously. The growth in secondary transaction volume is it's almost 50% per year. It's now over $100 billion a year of volume. And it's become very, very uh, clean and precise and, and in many cases equally as transparent and, and constructive as using uh, real exchanges to buy and sell the shares. And it's a great way for us to buy shares at very attractive valuations and provide access to people who wouldn't ordinarily have access to shares like this. It's one of the other areas that we think we bring some knowledge and expertise with. And it's a great area, way for us to add value in our relationships. But it's a great question. There's a lot of other trends, and I'll be speaking at many conferences around the world in the year ahead with ideas and trends that we're talking about. I do think there's very significant changes ahead, uh, really exciting changes ahead in terms of sustainability, in terms of profitability, in terms of harnessing some of the technology power that we're seeing. You know, the world has got three and a half billion people on the internet now on a daily basis. Yet there's still another three and a half billion people who are not yet on the internet. And SpaceX is putting up a low orbit satellite network and other things like this to get people access. I think there's really tremendous opportunities to take the collective wisdom of the markets and of the internet and of various other pools of knowledge and capital to make the world a better place. And we're seeing those kinds of ideas percolate in corporate America and, and corporations around the world. And we think there's going to be some really significant innovation over the next decade or so. So I am very excited about the trends ahead. And I look forward to talking to you more about that once I figure them all out. But it's a challenge every day to figure out what's ahead. Really difficult to look into the future and, and be correct. And that's what we'd have to do, though, and it's really exciting to do so.